Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, taking the time from the Alina application. So we have a, a big pleasure today to have uh, Ned here. So Ned, as you know, is the new shop appointment here in Spray. He just joined us a few weeks ago. Um, so first, welcome back. Uh, welcome here. So we bought you some gifts. Uh, <laughs> I hope that Thank the you. size is okay. It's uh, that was the smallest <laughs> that I can find, but we can change after that. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for the open day. Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. So, uh, Ned uh, graduated from the Imperial College in London um, a few years ago. And then after that, he was a research uh, uh, fellow in Japan for three years. He was here in Sydney two years in uh, the School of Physics in the uni uh, Sydney University. And then moved back uh, to London for 10 years almost in the Imperial College. And as I said, he joined us uh, a few weeks ago. I heard Ned a few times in conference. It's always a pleasure. First, because of the great accent. Yeah, it's like the BBC. Uh, and second, it's like he's knowledgeable. He's, uh, it's always, you always learn something and he explain what he knows in very clear way. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing you this time. Welcome to UNSW in spring. And please welcome Jit Ned. Thank you very much, Siv, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming this afternoon. I appreciate everyone's writing grants frantically. So uh, it's uh, great that you're here. And it's a pleasure to give you uh, a seminar with a provocative title. It's sort of bait, I suppose, to uh, attract you all here. Um, Solar Energy System Efficiencies, 70% uh, Fact or Fiction. And I thought what I wouldn't do is repeat the talk that I gave last year because you've already heard that. You've heard me talk already about sort of efficiency limits of photovoltaic cells, which is something I'm uh, very keen on. We do have done a lot of work on multi-junction cells. We remain very keen on multi-junction cells. Intermediate band cells will creep into a little bit of this, this presentation, uh, but last time I also talked about hot carrier cells. So. You're welcome to catch up on all that, if you wish, uh, on Rob's fantastic YouTube channel. But this time, uh, the aim here is to talk a little bit about work that we didn't cover in the last presentation, but which sort of at least formed a lot of my thinking in terms of can we reach sort of super high efficiencies? And today, sort of the target is 70%. And so I started my career with quantum well cells. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then that moved into uh, intermediate band cells, but in particular a molecular uh, implementation. And quite recently, uh, this has actually been demonstrated experimentally now. So I wanted to just sort of show you a little bit of that. And then I'd finish with a hybrid PV thermal system and some work we've been doing on engineering the emissivity of the solar cells in that PV thermal system. So, to begin with, I thought I should explain, just in one slide, Ziv gave a very nice uh, uh, biography, but sort of before I even went to university, I was fortunate enough to have one of these, a 75-in-1 electronic project, and maybe you too played with one of these where you get bits of wire and you sort of wire up a uh, sort of radio or make a burger alarm or Morse code transmitter, all sorts of things are possible. And on this board was a little solar cell. It's there on the bottom right. And I was interested in the solar cell, but it was a little bit unsatisfactory because all the projects required these batteries on the bottom right. And I couldn't seem to power very much at all with the solar cell. This was in the sort of mid 1980s. And sort of, uh, I expect that was a very early a uh, thin film cell, sort of a f only a few percent efficient. But that experience with that little so so solar cell on my project board remained with me. And then when I was a PhD student at Imperial College, I was fortunate enough to work with Keith Barnum, who had relatively recently proposed this idea for a solar cell. That just as in many optoelectronic devices, uh, you can gain benefit from uh, making very thin uh, inclusions into a semiconductor device, a quantum well, you have a two-dimensional electronic density of states in, in these very thin, thin layers. And Keith Barnum was interested in, could you make an efficient solar cell this way? And it was an idea that had been explored a little bit in the past, but one of Keith's uh, principal innovations was to make a PIN solar cell. 
and ensure that the quantum oil region was depleted, so it had an electric field across it. So the idea was, of course, you would have photogeneration across the entire solar cell, and you would get a bit of extra current from the quantum wells. They would sort of pump uh, electrons into the system. Of course, they would also behave as recombination centers as well. And so early on, they had quite significant success with this, in that uh, if you took an aluminium gallium arsenide solar cell, so that's got a relatively high band gap. You can see this with the spectral response, plotting the quantum efficiency. You can see the band gap there is about 730 nanometers. And so if you take an already high band gap solar cell and you put gallium arsenide quantum wells into that, you can extend the absorption very nicely out towards the band gap of gallium arsenide. You can see that in the quantum efficiency plot and you can see the result of the light IV, that the uh, short circuit current increases significantly, but the open circuit voltage goes down slightly because you've effectively made a lower band gap semiconductor. So in terms of demonstrating the principle, this was uh, shown very quickly or very soon after Keith published his initial paper on the quantum oil solar cell. A technological challenge, though, was how could you improve a gallium arsenide solar cell? So aluminium gallium arsenide has got a very high band gap. It was a nice technological demonstration, but uh, it's sort of practically you would want to improve a gallium arsenide solar cell. We've managed to extend the absorption of gallium arsenide. And for that, you needed to use an indium gallium arsenide quantum well. And so the trouble with that is if you were to take a gallium arsenide solar cell, put indium gallium arsenide quantum wells into that, you would still extend the absorption. You can see quantum efficiencies now on the left, that as you increase the number of quantum wells in this device, the uh, quantum efficiency goes up. It's still optically thin. That looks like it might be promising for increasing the current of the cell, but if you now look at the dark current, I'm plotting the dark current on the right-hand side, and it's a log, it's a log scale. I'm sorry, my EBIC image has obscured some of the y-axis there. Uh, you've got the gallium arsenide control there in black, uh, but then if you put in just 10 quantum wells, you get the red line, and the dark current has gone up by an order of magnitude. So that results in a large loss in voltage. And if you put in even more, the green curve corresponds to 23, the dark current has gone up by another order of magnitude. So the net result of this was uh, quite disappointing, that you take a good gallium arsenide cell, you introduce uh, not only these quantum wells, which the purpose was to photogenerate from, but you also introduce a lot of defects. And the reason for that is because the quantum wells are strained, and uh, along with the strain comes lattice relaxation, which we can see very clearly with these EBIC images of uh, that is sitting right in the middle of my slide. So it was at this point that I joined Imperial College in the mid-1990s, and the challenge was, could we, could we uh, improve matters? And I spent a long time in the wilderness, uh, I think many PhD students do, trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to control relaxation in strained quantum well layers. So you can see the problem, it's plotted on this chart of lattice constant versus band gap. <coughs> There's gallium arsenide uh, sitting in the middle, and what we were doing was we were using indium gallium arsenide. And you can see that has a lower band gap, but it also has a larger lattice constant. So this, this was problematic. We, uh, went, uh, uh, we invested a lot of effort into trying to solve this, but uh, Dr. John Roberts at the University of Sheffield uh, ended up uh, in introducing a phosphorus source in his uh, uh, MOVPE, Metal Organic Vapor Phase Epitaxy machine, and could then grow not only indium gallium arsenide, but importantly, gallium arsenide phosphide. And the nice thing with that is that gallium arsenide phosphide is tensile, has a higher band gap, but is tensile on a gallium arsenide lattice, and the indium gallium arsenide is, has to be compressively strained. So what we figured was, okay, well, if we combine these two materials correctly, then we might be able to grow a structure which is locally strained, but which the two layers are sort of strained off each other and don't exert any force then on the substrate. So I'm trying to sort of show this uh, 
in with the sort of ball and stick models above, above the photograph of John Roberts here, uh, you've got the, on the left sort of the relaxed lattice parameters uh, for the constituent materials. There's gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide phosphide, indium gallium arsenide. You can see gallium arsenide phosphide, we're going to have to, it will be tensile on gallium arsenide, whereas indium gallium arsenide will be compressive. If we grow the layer thicknesses correctly, we should be able to make a strained quantum well system, but one which doesn't have excessive defects. And this worked rather well. So this was our first result. We managed to get 20 quantum wells into the sy sy system. You can see there's the gallium arsenide control again. We've extended the absorption, increased the current. But importantly, the dark current hasn't increased uh, enormously. There's a small increase in the dark current. You expect that to some extent because you've got uh, a solar cell with an effectively a lower band gap. J the dashed line is showing you where the equivalent strained cell was, so you can really see the effect of the strain balance. Also, for fun, I'm showing you the EBIC image, which is effectively clean. There are no misfit dislocations in this device. There's no strain relaxation. So. The referee for this paper, and this was where sort of my PhD came out of this sort of U-curve, which I think many PhDs go through when sort of suddenly at the end everything starts working. Uh, the referee very kindly said, yes, we think this might represent a turning point for the quantum world technology, because we'd actually managed to increase the current of effectively a gallium arsenide cell, but without introducing uh, a lot of parasitic recombination. And we later, the second reference there is sort of all to do with the mechanics of how you actually correctly strain balance a, cis, a, cis, a system. There was some detail there which I'm happy to discuss with people if, uh, if you're interested. Now, many years passed. I went to Japan. Uh, I then worked at uh, Sydney Uni Un University. And uh, during that time, uh, my former PhD supervisor, Keith Barnum, formed a company. And this was a very sort of instructive lesson for us all because it really showed what, ha what can happen when you take research out of the academic environment, where we'd published some nice papers, and you really push the cell efficiency. And so the team managed to get a 28.3% efficiency, which in 2009 was actually a world record. So the world record in those days was 273 the investors of the company had set a pretty high bar of you need to break that record with your quantum world technology and then we'll give you the next round of funding. So they managed to achieve that. It was uh, heroic efforts by Keith Barnum, but also uh, John Ro Roberts, Mas Massimo Mazza, Tom Tibbetts, David Bushnell in particular. And they achieved 28.3% with that. The actual data that I'm showing you, you here hasn't been widely published. Jenny Nelson and I managed to get it into our book chapter on quant quantum wells cl in clean energy from photovoltaics. So this sort of really sort of brought this qu uh, the notion of can a quantum well system uh, be used to make a high efficiency so so solar cell to a conclusion? The answer is yes. You can engineer the absorption edge of a solar cell very effectively using these uh, quantum well layers if you wish. The company, the Quantasol company that Keith Barnum founded, was then acquired by the JDSU company. JDSU is famous for the components that they make that go into the world's fiber telecom systems. And many, many wafers later, about a thousand growths when, 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 went into this, they actually made a double quantum well system. This is a multi-junction cell which starts with a germanium junction, then it has a quantum well middle cell and a quantum well top cell. You've very nicely current matched all of those, those junctions. They achieved a 43.5% efficiency with that. And then sadly, JDSU perhaps correctly read the concentrate of photovoltaics market and closed the division. So the technology sort of peaked in the hands of JDSU. Returning though, perhaps to sort of the fundamental aspect of a quantum well cell, the original proposal made some ambitious claims for efficiency that maybe we, uh, by introducing sort of these uh, sort of quantum inclusions in a uh, solar cell, you might be able to increase the efficiency of the solar cell fundamentally. And that was quite controversial. 
Uh, Richard Corkish and Martin Green published a nice paper sort of somewhat supporting that view. And I like to think that it was this debate about sort of can you fundamentally increase the efficiency of sort of a solar cell which has a complicated density of states that led to the formulation of the intermediate band solar cell. So this very nice paper by Antonio uh, Antonio's Luque and Marti, uh, which you might be familiar with, proposed, well, if you would generalize so sort of what Keith Barnum drew in, in 1990 and say, okay, you now have an intermediate band, and importantly, and this, and this was an important step, you have optically driven transitions from the valence band into the intermediate band and out of the intermediate band into the conduction band, then you can achieve uh, efficiencies that are more or less equivalent to that of a triple junction solar cell. And so I sort of grew up as a, as a uh, graduate researcher in this debate and so sort of became interested in, in the problem in that if you take a solar cell with a sort of arbitrary band structure, so this, is, this looks like a heterojunction cell, the question that we could pose is, is this fundamentally more efficient than a Schottky-Quiser solar cell? Could it ever be more efficient than a Schottky-Quiser solar cell? And I think the answer is relatively straightforward, is that if, uh, I, here I'm, so in my diagram I'm showing you a complicated conduction band. So if the electrons in the conduction band have all equilibriated, so they can be described with a single Fermi energy, in this case quasi-Fermi energy, the answer would be no. This, it doesn't matter how complicated that band structure is, you won't be, in, you won't be exceeding the shockley quiser efficiency limit. However, if, on the other hand, you have uh, a, 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 possibly a sort of equally complicated band structure, but now you have strong optically allowed transitions between your valence band, your intermediate states, and your conduction band, then effectively you've got the equivalent circuit that I think uh, Martin uh, was one of the first to put in the third generation photo photovoltaics book. And so this led me, uh, during my time in Japan, to sort of think about, okay, well, what would the spectroscopic signature of an intermediate band, uh, intermediate band solar cell be? And so uh, I'm showing you three of the results from this, from this paper. Uh, there were, I think, sort of four uh, experiments in, in the paper itself. But the first very surprising result if you were to ever stumble across or to make an intermediate band material, would be that if you performed a simple PL experiment, this is what I'm trying to show you here on the left, you could excite va the valence band to conduction band transition. And what we normally see with PL is the uh, emission of light, but from the lowest energy state in the system. But if you've made an, e an efficient intermediate band material, then what will happen is you'll end up with uh, th three independent Fermi energies. So you have two Fermi energy separations, and that will drive the recombination processes quite differently in the solar cell than if it were a single Schottky-Quiser cell. So you can see my simulated lum uh, photoluminescence. I've, of course, got a strong peak at the lowest photon tra transition here, just at 0 0.8 electron volts but I also have almost equally strong peaks at 1.2 electron volts and 2 electron volts. And if you were to, if, if you were to uh, attempt this with a material that had exactly the same density of states, but just a conventional sort of two Fermi energies, so only one Fermi energy se separation, what you would find is that the emission at 2 electron volts would be about 10 to the 20 times weaker than the emission down at 0 0.8 electron volts. So this is a sort of very dramatic sort of first indication that you might have made an intermediate band material is if you perform a simple PL experiment and you see lots of peaks light up at very disparate energies that of course corresponds to the absorption thresholds from the various bands, then uh, you're on track. So then you might want to move on to the second test. And the second test was that if you were to sort of sequentially pump electrons through the intermediate band, and this is sort of conceptually obvious, but then you would achieve up conversion. And so you could pump uh, up from the valence band to intermediate band and, and from intermediate band to conduction band. You would of course get 
uh, emission from all the transitions in your device, but you would see emission from the conductive band to the valence band, which of course is one of the transitions you're not pumping in this particular experiment. So if your material then shows up conversion and relatively strong up conversion, that's going to be a positive sign as well. The third test I've got here is simply a sort of temperature of dependence. If you fix the pumping rates at, uh, at some level and then you perform a temperature dependency, you'll find that the emission uh, from your material uh, follows something quite different to what you would expect with a conventional, so sort of, shall we say, material where you have a, only two quasi-Fermi energies. In particular, you see a crossover at uh, in the PL intensities. That crossover cannot happen in a material which has uh, only two quasi-Fermi levels. Okay, so, so sort of in this pa paper we're trying to tease out experiments that might lead to th the first observation of an intermediate band solar cell because for sure if you're trying to make one and you take it off to the solar simulator and you measure the efficiency, you're not going to step back from the solar simulator and say, ah, oh, I've just measured 63% power conversion efficiency. I've obviously made an intermediate band solar cell. It's not going to work like that. You're, there are going to be many, many stages and decades of work to get there. So it was sort of having thought about uh, what an intermediate band solar cell might require, that then when I was at uh, the University of Sydney, uh, just, uh, uh, just down the road from here, that I was uh, working with Tim Schmidt, who was then at the uh, chemistry department at the University of Sydney. Tim has since moved to UNSW, so clearly sort of this is the place to be for doing sort of photovoltaic research. So, but Tim and I, uh, read this paper by Stanislav Balashev, where he was uh, making these very nice molecular upconverting systems. And I'll run you very briefly through how this works because it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I, and I also think it contains an important step for any efficient sequential absorption. This is some, something we touched on on my last talk here. But uh, the scheme is this, is that you, in my opinion, need to absorb the light strongly. So you, you, you need to have a strong allowed transition. And that allowed transition can take place if, for example, you have a porphyrin molecule and you can absorb, in this case, a bright red arrow that's pumping <coughs> electrons from a singlet ground state into its excited state. The important point of using a porphyrin molecule is that there's a large heavy metal atom in the middle, which means spin isn't well conserved. So the excitation in the singlet can cross into the triplet very efficiently. So what you're effectively doing is pumping a strong allowed transition, but then you're locking the energy into these long-lived triplet states. The triplet state can't decay radiatively back into the singlet state quickly. So whilst the lifetime, if you were to do a spectroscopy experiment of the singlet state by itself, might be of the order of nanoseconds, the lifetime of the triplet state is the order of hundreds of microseconds. So what you're doing then is pumping light into these triplet states, which we mark here on this diagram as T1, and locking the energy there for a significant amount of time. And, the, and what happens in that significant amount of time is then the excitation can move on to another emitter molecule. So in these solutions, there's always two molecular species. There's a sensitizer, which is what you're pumping, the excitation, the triplet, moves by dexter process to an emitter molecule. And the important thing with the emitter molecule is that the triplet state lies halfway, or very close to halfway, uh, between the ground state and the first excited singlet state. So that when two emitter molecules come together, they can undergo, undergo a process called triplet-triplet annihilation, and you end up populating the singlet state of the emitter molecule, which then promptly fluoresces, and that's what you can see in these nice sort of cuvettes at the bottom for a whole variety of different molecules. So we, we, Tim and I sort of read this paper and we thought, this is really, really interesting. I was very excited because I thought, okay, I think I can make an intermediate band solar cell out of this. And Tim was really excited because he loves doing spectroscopy on uh, molecules. Uh, Tim was working on astrochemistry. He still does do astrochemistry, but he also <coughs> now has uh, a lot of activities in upconversion and also the reverse process, singlet fission. 
one of the things that this led us to was to, uh, was to realize that the community at this time believed that this process would never be useful for solar energy conversion. And the, and the objection lay with the triplet-triplet annihilation step. It's a discussion we can have uh, lay later on if you wish, but uh, there's a one in nine chance that if you have these molecules that, that collide, that you will end up populating the singlet state. So in the community, the, the uh, response was, well, this is a nice idea, but it will never be more efficient than 11%. So it's not particularly useful for photovoltaics. We countered that and said, well, actually, no, because just because you have an unsuccessful encounter doesn't necessarily mean the energy is lost. Where does the energy go? And so Tim's group at the University of Sydney still uh, showed that uh, these molecular upconversion systems internally have efficiencies higher than 60%. So that uh, sort of helped establish this approach as something that might be useful for solar power conversion. Anyway, to move on, uh, this was uh, the sort of the, the result of my thinking about this was that we could make a sort of slightly constrained, we called it a symmetric intermediate band cell where you would sort of absorb light using sensitizer molecules, you'd populate triplet states, you'd feed that into uh, your so-called emitter, but rather than allow the emitter to fluoresce, you'd build something rather similar to a disensitized cell, but it's just now that disensitized cell can absorb not only directly in the emitter from ground state to excited state and then inject, but you could also populate the intermediate triplet level, which would then undergo triplet-triplet annihilation. And quite recently, at the end of 2015, Catherine Simps Simpson uh, with Tim Schmidt's group and Andrew Natstead at the Wollongong actually demonstrated this. So an intermediate band cell has actually now been demonstrated that uh, operates off this principle that we devised in 2008. So we're quite excited about this. Of course, efficiencies are low, but this is uh, sort of an area which uh, can, I think, improve a lot in efficiency. But let's step back, because I promised you 70% at the beginning of this seminar. And I'm showing you some things which have sort of reached, well, 43.5% was the highest we got with quantum wells. You know, uh, where's that 70%? And so I've adapted a slide which I showed in my last presentation, which was to sort of plot where I, and this is a personal opinion, where these things might sit on a TRL scale. So of course, crystalline silicon, right at the top of the TRL scale, we can go down the road, buy crystalline silicon panels and put them on roofs. And the efficiency with that little black arrow I'm suggesting extends to sort of 25%. And if we go down the multi-junction route, then of course we can push that uh, sort of to, to maybe 30%. If we then take more exotic materials, more expensive materials, we can reach the world record of 46%. But beyond that, my sort of red uh, dashed arrow is showing you that you're going to go plummeting down that TRL scale as you push into 40%, and we end up in sort of basic TRL1 uh, uh, rather quickly. The uh, up conversion, spectral conversion, I would say sort of is sort of at the bottom end of the TRL, the efficiency uh, improvements that are coming out of those processes are relatively, uh, relatively small, so it's very much sort of demonstrating the concept rather than making efficient solar cells, but the potential to reach efficiencies above 40% are there. But how are we going to reach system efficiencies above 70%? At this point, you'll have to forgive me, I shall cheat and rename my axis, which actually is poorly defined as efficiency, and say, well, what about heat? Because if I'm allowed to use heat, then I can get to high system efficiencies quite quickly. And so we, uh, this was an opportunity that I had in London, which was to work with this uh, uh, startup com 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 company, it's, n it's now a small S SME based uh, just south of London called Naked Energy, who invented this Virtue PV module. And what it is, is crystalline silicon solar cells laminated onto a novel and efficient heat plate in an evacuated tube. And so this reduces a lot of the thermal losses that you would get with a normal PVT system and 
Uh, they've demonstrated up to 80% system efficiency, so that's, of course, electrical output plus ther ther thermal output in two locations. They've got a trial on a large supermarket in the south of England and also in a hotel in Malta, and I'm showing you a sort of picture of a part of the system at the hotel in Malta there. So this company uh, came, came, came to us and they sort of said, OK, well, we'd like to work with you to sort of help improve our technology. And if I'm honest, I sort of thought, OK, well, I'm not UNSW and you're using uh, crystalline silicon cells. There might be a limit to what we might can do for you here, but we'll do our best. And so we th I thought, well, this is actually an interesting problem because I don't actually know what the emissivity of a crystalline silicon cell, cell, cell is. And if you're using monocrystalline sil sil silicon, there's an opportunity to perhaps use some of the more advanced technologies that got lower temperature coefficients. So that was our initial thought. But this got us thinking, and this is really my motivation for working in this field, it, thinking about the applications that a PVT system can have. Because I think it's fair to say that it, there is a quite, a quite a compelling argument to say, well, there's a sizing problem here. If you want heat, have a thermal system. If you want electricity, have an electrical system. And this chart, and this is actually a nice pa paper, so if you're interested, in, I, I, I recommend it by Fox et al. in Energy Environmental Science, plots the percentage of US energy demand excluding transport uh, as a sort of cumulative as a function of utilization temperature. And what we see is that there is a great deal of heat. So if we allow ourselves to go to say sort of 100%, oh, sorry, 100 degrees Celsius, we find that we're seeing sort of 20 to 30 percent of the thermal demand in the United States is at that temperature. So that shows us that there's, that there's maybe an opportunity for uh, PVT systems if we can reach relatively high temperatures. And by high temperatures, I mean so temperatures above sort of 80 degrees, maybe up to 100. And so this little diagram I've got above the chart, again taken from the paper by Fox, uh, shows some of the applications. So obviously, if you want to heat a swimming pool, that's very low grade heat. That's relatively easy. Uh, if you want to sort of uh, do uh, water and space heating, that might be 50 degrees. Something I think is really interesting is if you get above 80 degrees, you can, ab you can drive an absorption refrigeration cycle. So it means that the, the abundance of heat that you would get from a PVT system in summer can be used to cool the building. I think that's, that's an opportunity uh, that presently is not, is not being pursued particularly uh, aggressively. So. We wanted to help the Naked Energy Company uh, improve their system, reduce th thermal losses, reach higher temperatures. And so this led us to ask the question, well, what is the emissivity of crystalline silicon? And uh, the answer is very clear. Uh, we know a lot about how crystalline silicon solar cells absorb light. I think we all live in the photovoltaics community in the visible and near infrared. So the black curve is very well, uh, very well known, particularly to everyone in this room. And Rudy Sandbergen published a lovely paper in 2008 where he elegantly decomposes all the different absorption processes in a silicon solar cell. But if we go out to where there's going to be thermal emission, which is around about 10 microns, then we have uh, rather conflicting views. If we take a highly doped textured wafer, we find the emissivity is very high, close to unity. If we take an undoped polished crystalline silicon wafer, then we find it's very low. And of course, the crystalline silicon solar cell is both of these. So what might it be? So in our research project, we uh, and we were fortunate enough to receive some national funding in Britain to do this, we set about measuring the emissivity. So you can do this with an integrating sphere. Uh, you can measure the transmittance and reflectance of your, of your sample. And then we set about calculating it. And so we lifted a nice diagram out of one of Martin's book chapters, and we thought about how light might uh, propagate through that, through that so, so solar cell. And evidently, the presence of the surface texture brings some issues. Because we've got this a range of dimensions here. The cell itself, as many of you know, we, in the short wavelength range, we can address with just a ray tracing approach. 
But the trouble is we're interested in 10 microns here, which means that we have now light that has a similar wavelength scale, uh, the wavelength rather is of similar length scale to the features of the texture. And so a full wave calculation is going to be computationally prohibitive for a cell that is as large as a crystalline silicon solar cell. So the dimensions that we're dealing with here is we've got a wafer that's 200 microns, we've got textures which some might be of the order of 4 microns, and we've got features here like the coatings which might be 50 nanometers. So the way we solved this was we used this very nice formalism that uh, uh, people at the Fraunhofer Institute have, uh, have developed, this Optos form formalism, very briefly, because I realize I'm, I'm now short of time. Uh, it breaks the problem down into, into three areas. You have at the top an area which has a texture, and so we have at the bottom a sort of redistribution of photon flux is the is the way it's uh, described in the Optus form formalism, and we can describe that redistribution of the photon flux with a matrix. So what we have to do then is some calculations that fill in these elements of our matrix as to how the light is going to be redistributed as it crosses that boundary. In uh, zone D, the light just propagates through our material, so it gets absorbed, uh, and then in uh, C, once again, we have another redistribution matrix. And so we deal with the thin layers of this, uh, of the, of this structure by ray tracing through the sort of macroscopic features and then using a transfer matrix wave optical approach for the thin layers that sit on top of this texture. If you do all that, then you can decompose the absorption in a crystalline silicon cell quite nicely, sort of uh, following Rudy Sandbergen's approach. Rudy stopped at 2 microns. We've effectively carried on here now uh, past 10 microns, and we get an answer to our question. The emissivity of a bare crystalline silicon solar cell is actually surprisingly high. It's up at about 80%, and that's due to <coughs> free carry absorption in the emitter layer, uh, as well as the back surface, uh, back surface field. Uh, the aluminium rear contact has relatively little, uh, relatively little uh, effect on the emissivity, mainly because the cell isn't transparent anymore at those wavelengths. The free carry absorption is actually very, very strong. So uh, this was a result that a visiting student uh, to, our, to our group in London, Alberta Riverola, uh, managed to achieve. And I'll skip over some details. You're welcome to ask me later on, but we also ask the question, because the emissivity of uh, silicon so solar cells has been something of interest of, uh, for a group in Stanford who are trying to do exactly the reverse of what we're doing, which is to increase the emissivity as much as possible. And so you've already seen that the emissivity of crystalline silicon is actually already very high. So what hope is there to make it higher still? Well, of course, we've got a slightly unusual problem because with the Naked Energy Company, we've got these solar cells unencapsulated but in an evacuated tube. So the bare cell emissivity is the relevant quantity. But any normal photovoltaic module, of course, is encapsulated and has glass sitting on top. So if you do the same calculation, but now you have the encapsulant and the glass, then you end up with this. And you find that the low iron soda lime glass has a little dip sitting at about nine microns, and this is what Shen Hui Fan's group at uh, Stanford has been very successful at filling. He's made a nice photonic crystal uh, in, in the glass which can, sorry, if you like, recover high emissivity at long wavelength. So this is, uh, 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 this was a nice sort of extension of our optical model, but it's what rather putting our work into context. For the Naked Energy Company, uh, this isn't a particularly useful result because they have uh, their cells sitting in the evacuated tube. So the last thing I want to show you is how we might control the emissivity. And this turned out to be at least conceptually straightforward. If any of you know how we make low emissivity glass, what we do is we take glass and we deposit a layer of uh, indium tin oxide, ITO, onto it and then the free electrons there make a very nice reflector in the mid-infrared. 
So we did this, we just took commercial crystalline silicon cells, we deposited some ITO on them, we did some SEM to make sure that that was actually what had happened, and we can uh, quite nicely reduce the emissivity of the crystalline silicon solar cell. Uh, so you can see it's dropped from that black curve down to the red curve. There is plenty more improvement you can make. I mean, the blue dashed curve there is sort of showing you our target, and the target would be to get it down to about 10%. We managed to do this, and to be honest, this was really our first experiment. Uh, so we haven't made the, we didn't make the crystalline silicon cell. We merely obtained one and then coated it. So it turned green. And if, when we look at the quantum efficiency, of course, you realize that you've changed the anti-reflective pro properties. There's a small loss in short circuit current here uh, because we've compromised the uh, anti-reflection coating slightly. But this was su su sufficient, we felt, to actually try a system test. So the Naked Energy Company made a heat plate with this, uh, with this sort of emissivity controlled surface. And we did some uh, indoor tests. They're performing outdoor tests right now. And the indoor tests show a 10% uh, efficiency gain on the thermal side. And because we've slightly compromised the uh, short circuit current, there's about a half a percent uh, electrical efficiency loss. So we, w this project is going on for another year. The sort of t one of the aims in, in the next year is to sort of integrate the emissivity control with the anti-reflection coating. Uh, we're working with a group at uh, University of Glasgow who have, uh, in my opinion, one of the best uh, sort of silicon fabrication facilities in 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 Britain they right now have a 14% monocrystalline cell process which which we're very proud of because they didn't have anything 2 years ago uh, and so uh, the aim is 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 to make a combined cell which has suppressed emissivity uh, which uh, can demonstrate the potential for this but moving on to, into the future i think there's a lot of opportunity for controlling emissivity both for this rather specialist ap application of PVT, but also, of course, the reverse, which uh, is what the group in Stanford are interested in. So to conclude and to answer my question, solar energy system efficiency of 70% factual fiction. I think, I mean, this is right now largely fiction for uh, pure photovoltaic devices. I mean, the day I retire, I'll be very happy if these arrows have marched further to the right. Um, but I'd say, given that we have climate change on our hands, we want as much renewable energy as possible, I think there's a real opportunity for us to think about what we can do with PVT sys sys systems, and our work with Naked Energy is an example of where I hope we've been able to help a company make a better and more efficient product. So I'd like to just finish by acknowledging uh, the team at Imperial College who sort of have done a lot of particularly the emissivity work, which right now is sort of under, under review. Uh, so in physics, Alex Meller and Diego Alonso Vares have done a huge amount of work. Uh, Tom Wilson, Phoebe Pierce, uh, as, as well on our photovoltaic pro project. And we also work very closely uh, with uh, Christos Markidis' group uh, in chemical en engineering. Ilaria just got her PhD, and Alba is working as a postdoc on our PVT uh, project at the moment. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for um, coming along, hearing about uh, our, our work, and I think we might have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Questions? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Ned. Um, so with the, um, the combined PVT system, yes. in terms of um, economics, if you had enough space and you just had one dedicated PV system and one dedicated thermal system, uh, is there any indication that that's, um, that's going to be a, 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 a big uh, economic benefit of combining them compared to having two separate systems? I think if you've got enough space, then a PVT isn't, uh, it sort of loses quite a lot of its appeal. I think it's when you have constrained space. Uh, so, uh, and, and I mean, I think we can think about this, ob obviously, if you're building a sort of shopping center, or I mean, possibly in domestic homes too, uh, then you, then PVT in the future, I think, 
will be important. I mean, I think the real crunch point comes when we're interested in renewable heat. Uh, I mean, right now, I think photo photovoltaics is doing a great job at sort of displacing grid electricity and so on. We know that story very well. But heat is some, something I feel we've, we've, we've neglected a bit. So, so wherever you need sort of lowish grade heat and you are constrained in space, then I think there's an opportunity for PVT. Rob. Um, for that design, did you look at the emissivity of the back side of every, of, like the copper tubing and the back side of the cell? No, we haven't yet. But yes, I mean, that's, there's, there's obviously thermal loss there too. Martin. Yeah, no, no nice presentation. I think your work fits in with a couple of programs that are here, like we have a combined uh, PV thermal program here, as well as um, inspired by the Stanford work, we're looking at ways of producing cooler modules by controlling the emissivity and convection as well. Right. Um, but one point, oh, and another point is I guess the industry is transitioning to um, PERC type cells and they have far different emissivity from the, uh, from the standard BSF cells because there's not as much absorption in the back contact. So That's they right. have yeah. naturally have lower infrared emissivity as a result of that. Um, but one comment I often make about control, I've been making this for decades, like it goes back to at least the 80s. Um, you know, a rule of thumb is any degradation pro process accelerates by a factor of two for every 10 degree centigrade rise. And if you look at some of the detailed testing that's been done of photovoltaic modules, it comes out pretty similar figures, you know, like I found between seven and 12 degrees will double degradation rates for any experimental data that you pick up in relation to PV modules. So by operating combined thermal PV, you're going to, you know, at least half the life and maybe quarter the life of, of the photovoltaic device um, in all probability, just because of the 20 or whatever degree um, increase in temperature. So what are, any comments on that? Well, yes, I, I'll, uh, so I think, I think I, I, I defend Naked Energy slightly in, in that they've got a, uh, PV cells and evacuated tube, which is sort of quite a different environment. I think the failure modes for that will be quite different. Uh, so there's no encapsulant, for example. There is, of course, a lamination. Um, from what I know in concentrated photovoltaics, I mean, I think that, and for sure, I mean, with crystalline silicon, I wouldn't dispute the module degradation uh, that's been observed and sort of well understood. So if the degradation is thermally sort of activated, then absolutely I'd agree that if you run your cells hot, they're going to degrade faster. But if it's a temperature cycling, and this is one of the, one of the degradation mechanisms in CPV systems, then there's at least an opportunity for PVT to sort of mitigate that to some extent. Because for CPV, it's not so much the cell temperature that causes the degradation, it's the daily cycling from, or indeed, so sort of during the day, the cycling of the temperature, so high temperature to low temperature. So I think if your failure mode is the delta T, the cycling, then PVT can perhaps help mitigate that. If it's, of course, uh, just elevated cell temperature, then, then for sure, you're going to lose efficiency. I suppose I'm, I'm anxious, and to be honest, I think I, w I underwent a sort of conversion when we started working with, with, with Naked Energy, when I sort of thought, we so urgently need to address the energy problem that even if you, you're installing something which has, let's say, no more than a 20-year life, uh, life expectancy, that's actually taking us right now you know, 10 years is going to take us to 2027, 20, 20 years is going to take us to 2037. We need to be at really low carbon uh, energy gen generation by that stage. So I think absolutely that it's going to have an impact on the lifetime of the system. But I sort of feel we're running out of time to, to solve the climate problem anyway. So that's, that's why I'm motivated here, uh, <laughs> is, is to try and get renewable energy and of course, I'm a photovoltaics person. I mean, that's, that's where my background lies. You saw all the quantum world work. But I sort of uh, will stand up for, for, the, for, the, for, for, for the PVT crowd. And uh, you know, I, I think there's, there, there's a role to play for, the, for them to play. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> I'm going to now ask on the quantum world uh, 
prices. Right. So I have, I guess, uh, two questions. One is, because it's a PIN structure, yes. you're ultimately then, um, I suppose that the um, field factor is going to be affected because your uh, IV actually depends on the voltage that you are, right? Yep. And so why go there if now you have gallium arsenide phosphide where you can actually choose your band gap and be matched to some substrate without having to go to quantum wells? So why not go onto a specific composition rather than go to quantum wells? If you can grow the quaternary material, then, I mean, that's, and, and you can do that well, then that's, then that's a very, uh, a very sensible thing to do. I mean, often you find the diffusion lengths in the quaternary materials are quite, quite short. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, it, here, it, in a sense, what you're really doing is saying we can grow the ternary materials that are strained to, strained to gall gallium arsenide very cleanly. I mean, the background doping of that multi-quantum well stack is extraordinarily low. It's around about 10 to the 14 per cubic cent centimeter. So it means you can make this very sort of wide depletion uh, region device. <coughs> Under concentration, because you mentioned the fill, fill factor, and you're absolutely right. At one sun, you're dominated by shockley reed hall recombination in in that depleted layer. But under concentration, it actually becomes radiatively dominated. And so we, we, we realized this when we put a Bragg reflector un underneath the cell to sort of uh, boost the absorption. But then we noticed that the voltage went up too because we were sort of in a, in a, in a weak way doing what outer devices have done when they've removed the substrate and confined light in, in the cell. So, so when these devices are operating the radiative limit, the cell architecture doesn't actually matter so much anymore. So a PIN at, at high enough photon flux, and you've pushed it in so it's radiatively dominated, is uh, really efficient. And that's why we set that, well, briefly set, set that record efficiency. Because for sure, at the sort of 400 and however many suns it was, uh, the cells radiatively dominated. Okay. Richard. Thank, thanks for the last talk, Matt. Um, back in the 1990s, um, the Spanish group, the Madrid group, Luque's group, were arguing very strongly um, about uh, the unsuitability of quantum wells relative to quantum dots, uh, because uh, really on the basis, I think, of the relaxation can happen in the, the lateral dimension, or through the in the quantum wells, uh, whereas it was blocked. So it's the only had quantization in partial quantization in quantum wells, and then full quantization in the quantum dots. So I, I sort of drifted away and uh, stopped following the argument. But where did they go? Okay, so uh, I mean that's 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 a really important question, Richard, because it tugs at many of the sort of quantum dot intermediate band so solar cell notions. The uh, so so the the objection to using a quantum well as an intermediate band device is that it looks something like this uh, this structure, in that although you've got these confined levels, there's going to be very fast relaxation because you've got a continuum of states. You have very fast uh, phonon mediated re relaxation to the lowest energy level that there is. So it looks some, some, something like this. And to be honest, if you pump a quantum well sy sy system at modest levels, so that it's sort of up to sort of several thousand suns, that model holds. And so the notion of the quantum dot is that because you've got isolated states, then of course the transition between those isolated states is uh, much slower, and you know you you might then be able to make something like this, where you have these three independent Fermi energies. I think the reality is that the relaxation in quantum dots still proceeds extremely quickly if you have confined electrons and holes. So. The, the, I mean, it's not an area that we've sort of personally worked in. We've, we've tended to focus on quantum wells sort of exclusively, and that's because, well, we know how to make them well, we understand them well, and so on. Uh, and there's another talk I can give all about our quantum well photon ratchet result, which I hope will be published soon. 
which is an attempt to make an intermediate band cell using quantum wells, despite all those objections. I mean, it's, it's a demonstration rather than an efficient device. But to come back to the point on quantum dots, if you have confined electron and hole in the same volume, in the same dot, then what happens is because the hole has got a whole spectrum of states, and they're, and they're coupled, the electron can very easily transfer energy to the hole, drop down, and then the hole can dissipate that, that energy back to the phonon. So it's this sort of Auger-mediated cooling. There is a, some evidence to suggest that when you don't have the hole present, then the relaxation from, say, one confined state to another in a quantum dot is slower. But uh, how useful that, that is for a photovoltaic device, I think, is something that still needs more thinking through. I guess uh, certainly the mantra we, we sort of grew up with, shall we say, at Imperial College, because we actually did some quantum dot work a long time ago, it was probably 1997, was we had to improve the electronics of our quantum efficiency rig to actually measure the photo response. And that demonstrated to me in a very graphic way, because I think I was responsible for sort of, you know, improving the electronics. To, was that the absorption cross-section, of course, is very low because, I mean, already a quantum well only gives you 1% for every quantum well you've got. So your stack of 20 gives you 20% EQE. But a quantum dot layer is 1 20th of a percent per layer. So you, you have to grow a lot of quantum dots to actually get strong optical absorption. I'm not saying it's hopeless. Uh, there's uh, plenty of people here working coll colloidal quantum dots where you can sort of pack the density quite nicely. But yeah, it's it's at a very sort of early stage, I would say. I'm not sure if there is class after us, so if there is more questions, maybe still here. Uh, let's thank Nate for great talk. Okay, thank you.